Hello everyone, I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Post ESMO 2023, we've seen multiple practice changing studies in bladder cancer, GI cancer, and of course, lung cancer. Specifically in lung cancer, we saw a lot of data in patients with actionable mutations, and one drug that should be on your radar is amivantamab. To cover all things amivantamab and look at the data for Papillon study, an EGFR exon 20 mutation in first line, then Mariposa and Mariposa 2 for activating EGFR mutations, we're joined by Dr. Alex Spira. In this discussion, we're also going to cover some clinical pearls on managing toxicity from amivantamab and then close off with Libretto 431 data for ret fusion positive non-small cell lung cancer. We have a lot to cover here, so let's get started. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Welcome, Alex. To get started, let's take a look at our first study, the Papillon, a phase three study looking at the combination of amimantumab with chemo versus our current standard of care, chemo for EGFR exon 20 insertion mutation. Amivantumab is already approved in second line for this particular patient population. And we also have mobocertinib here, but that is being pulled off the market because of the weak data that we have. Coming back to Papillon study, what did the study exactly show? Yeah, so the, the idea about Papillon is trying to move, as you said, moving amivantumab in the first line setting. It was felt not to be good enough to beat chemo on its own, which is why the study is comparing it with chemo rather than in lieu of chemo. Obviously, that's still a good question. Uh, but I mean, these are curves that are as, as good as it gets, right? I mean, on the bottom line, if you look at PFS, 12-year uh, landmark, 48 versus 13 percent, 18-month, 31 versus 3 percent progression-free survival, a hazard ratio of 0.39. You know, that's as good as it gets. So clearly significantly better when you get amivantamab in the frontline setting. And of course, none of us are too surprised by this, right? I think we were surprised more about how good it was improved based uh, upon the data. So this is practice changing, and it was a concurrent New England Journal presentation. Thanks for bringing that up. I think it is so important to consider our best treatment options upfront. And again, something to reiterate, the treatment response with this combination was also a whole lot better. So yes, the PFS is improved, but also the response rate was better with the combination. Alex, in your clinic, based on Papillon study, a patient with EGFR exon 20, are you going to be prescribing amivantamab with chemo upfront moving forward? Yeah, so I think outside of a clinical study, and there are actually are some other good clinical studies ongoing as we speak, but to me, this is a no-brainer right now. Everybody should be getting this in the frontline setting uh, for lots of reasons. One is it's better, and two, if you really drill down to some of the data, uh, and by the way, this data was not only it was good, but remember, there was crossover as well. So this is accounting for the fact that many people got ADME at progression, so in theory, the data is even better. Uh, you know, it's of note that in all these studies, there's a real percentage of the population. I don't know if they reported in Papillon. They did. It was looked at in both Mariposa and Flora too. About the third to 40 percent of patients never get to second line therapy. So you're going to be giving people targeted therapy here, and a significant number of those never would have gotten a chance to get it. So yes, the answer is yes, completely. So moving along from one practice changing to another practice changing study. All right, now let's assume that we are doing a good job with NGS testing, and instead of exon 20, we see one of the common activating EGFR mutations. Mariposa, another phase three study, compares the current standard of care osimertinib with lazertinib or a combination of amivantumab and lazertinib. The primary endpoint here is PFS, and secondary endpoint is OS. What did the study show, Alex? Yeah, so this is, uh, thanks for uh, leaving those up so I can see it. Uh, this is a very straightforward study and I have slightly different conclusions when you get to what does this mean for practice changing. But bottom line is, uh, and we're now we're just looking at AMI-LAS versus OC. Uh, the LAS versus OC was really to document that OC, that I'm sorry, that LAS is going to be just as good as OC, which we believe it was and it was shown here. But what you can see is number one, Patients responding clearly improved. Duration of response clearly improved, 25 versus 16 months. <clears throat> and the primary endpoint, PFS, one year landmark, 73 versus 65, two year landmark, 48 versus 34%. So clearly doing better with AMI LAS right now. Uh, 
we kind of expected this because we knew we know amivantamab in the second line setting, and we'll look at that a little bit again with Mariposa too. But there's been very good data from Chrysalis that showed that amivantamab is a very good look good drug in the second line setting. And by giving it in the front line setting, you're improving outcomes really across the board. Hazard ratio, not quite as good as Papillon at 0.7. Alex, this data is of course exciting, but as a community oncologist, I also have to get comfortable with supportive care. Can we dive into the side effects of this combination for a second? We saw higher venous thromboembolisms with emivantamab and lizertinib. Do we need to start prophylactic apixaban or rivaroxaban up front now? So you're now going to have three options in the frontline setting. You're going to have OC by itself. We know about Flora 2, which was chemo OC versus chemo, and now you have amylase. And there are some subtle differences in, in this. Uh, you, it is going to be recommended that you give patients prophylactic anticoagulation. Um, Unclear if that's going to be a black box warning or mandatory. It'll probably just be a very strong recommendation. There was clearly increased toxicity with DVTs and PEs. Nothing major. They were all manageable uh, when you're giving the combination. The etiology is unclear. Some hypothesize that it worked so well that you were killing tumor so much with the combination that you're having a DIC like effect like effect. Some hypothesize that's an inflammatory respect with the combination. Of course, we don't know the answer, but this does require, in my mind, prophylactic anticoagulation. Prophylactic doses, not therapeutic doses. History of prior DVT or PE should not make you not think about this. But of course, putting patients on a blood thinner is a risk, as is everything, uh, every time we do it. And thanks for covering that, Alex. And as you stated, and just to dwell on that, now we have the option of osimertinib, or lizertinib alone versus chemo with osimertinib or amivantamab with lizertinib. In your clinic, when you are going to prescribe amivantamab with lizertinib or single agent osimertinib, what do you think will that scenario look like and when would you even consider this? So I guess when am I going to dose escalate is what you're saying, right? And that's a really tough question. And if you look at the discussants, and I went, you know, I'm an, a co-author in Mariposa, I'm in the steering committee, I was very enthusiastic about it. But when you get to talk to everybody at these meetings, which is the fun part, it was a lot a lot more muted. I mean, while you have improvement in outcomes here, it comes with real toxicity. AMI does have, you know, you have to give people DDT prophylaxis. Uh, you, uh, of course, worry about the amivantamab toxicity, which is skin rash, paronychia, infusion-related reactions. The IRRs will likely go away because there's a lot of thought and to the development of a subcutaneous form not available yet. Hopefully it demonstrates that it does. We'll free up chair time, make lives easier for patients, less IRs as well. But you're still talking about increasing toxicity. And let's face it, guys, it's very nice to give somebody a pill and have them come in and say, you're on a pill, you're doing great. And it does work really well. So we need more analysis. Uh, there will be some patients that have higher burden of disease that you want to drive more tumor uh, down in. Uh, there was an, uh, the beginning of an OS benefit in Mariposa. We didn't quite see that in Florida too. And if you ask 100 oncologists right now that are thoracic oncologists, about two thirds say they don't think they're going to see an overall survival benefit in Florida too. We do think we're going to see one in Mariposa because it was almost there. The p value was 0.11. So we'll probably get there with the next data cut, so, which would be great. But there's a lot to go into it. You know, they're going to be looking at things as, do you do worse if you have L858R? Because we do know those patients don't do as well as Exxon 19. Is a commutation such as P53 or RB1 going to bode for worse? None of us know that answer, right? So we're all going to struggle right now as to what's a better drug to give in the frontline setting. Uh, you know, we, I like to say you can just have the discussion with your patients. But, you know, you guys are oncologists. You know what the answer is <laughs> going to be. What do you think I should do, doc? And I also will tell you that if you tell them one thing, somebody else will tell them the other thing. I think just because we've all had that, I'll go for the second or third opinion. And let's face it, patients. And, and I think a big take home message is if you look at the data, and this is true from both from Mariposa and Flora too, 40% of patients never get the second line therapy. That's a huge number of patients. And here you have a controlled setting of a clinical study, right? What happens in the real world? Uh, they were actually also able to look at some of what's called the PFS2 analyses and said many patients just went on to single to agent TKI once they progressed on one of these two, which I find a little strange uh, as well. So in me, I think it's going to involve looking at the patient, thinking about how aggressive they want to be, how young they are, do they want to put up with everything? And, 
it's because while we can say those other analyses will be great, you know as well as I, it's going to be another 24 months before we get those analyses. So to me, it's really drilling down to the patient desires and how I want to treat patients right now. You know, I didn't mention much about Flora too. You know, you know, it's nice to offer patients a non-chemo option. If you ask me, there's not a lot of different toxicity between Flora 2 and Mariposa. You know, Carbopem is a pretty well-tolerated regimen for the most part. There's obviously something very nice about a chemo-free regimen, which is what Mariposa offers. So I basically dodged your question. No, I think this is important because at the end of the day, having these conversations and understanding the granular data and maybe just picking the right patient is so important. So thank you for covering that. Moving on, I think a bigger unmet need is also what to do next. Appreciating a small cell lung cancer clone or looking for resistant mutation at the time is very important. But again, that is a small portion of our patients. Mariposa 2 looks at this unmet need comparing amivantamab lizertinib combination with chemo versus amivantamab with chemo or chemo alone. The primary endpoint again here is PFS and OS is our secondary endpoint. Alex, your thoughts here? So, you know, the standard of care is chemotherapy, a million clinical trials ongoing. So the idea here is, can you improve on chemotherapy? And it looks like you can, right? So amy chemo versus chemo, clearly improvements here. The question is whether or not you add lizertinib or not. Uh, the lizertinib versus amy chemo, you know, those lines don't look significantly different right there. There's a lot of overlap as well. And, you know, you're probably not going to go into a lot of these, but some of the other slides did not show, did not even look as good as this one. So to me, it's looking at um, the blue line versus the tan line right now, or the red line versus the tan line. And clearly we we learn, and it's not a surprise based upon chrysalis, that AMI does improve outcomes with chemo versus chemo alone. And once approved with, is a new standard of care in that scenario. The hazard ratios are great here as well. You know, whether or not, you know, lizertinib needs to be done, probably does not need to be done. We consider LAS the same as OC. So, you know, right now, in my mind, we give up a lot of people osimertinib with chemotherapy just because it's totally in the absence of data. Uh, and it's one of those things we're not supposed to be doing, but I don't know what it's like by you guys, but everybody I know says just just give it. Well, just give it comes with toxicity cost and it also comes with a financial cost that it's easy to say forget about, but you can't. So to me, AMI clearly is a standard of care right now with chemo. The addition of lizertinib neither here nor there. And then it's going to come down to, there'll be some people that say, give OC frontline, give chemo AMI second line, and you hit everybody. And that's not unusual to do right now, although you are missing some of those people that never get the second line, but it's not an unreasonable combination here that we can do right now. And as you can see, the response rates were not reasonably different. I mean, basically the same AMI in the, on, the bot, on the left side, AMI chemo versus AMI last chemo. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, it is important that we do look at this data and dive in, especially with the CNS benefit, which is commendable, whether you combine that with lazertinib uh, or not. Uh, just looking at this data, particularly from amivantamab, because we'll be utilizing this drug a lot in our clinics. As we've talked about the rash, uh, some of the toxicity. Now, would you suggest to dose reduce if we see any of these uh, toxicities or how would you recommend managing some of these side effects? So, so the management of AMI is, it's, you know, dose reduction doesn't do a heck of a lot. It's usually dose delays. There is a lot of uh, skin creams, lotions, topical steroids. You know, I usually start with, uh, for lack of a better term, and I hate to use brand names, Selsun Blue. Uh, it actually works well on the scalp. Hib uh, uh, peroxide washes or other washes, chlorhexidine washes on the hand, oral doxycycline. Uh, it's not going to be mandatory that you give these patients, so it's not going to be in the label, but probably, you know, we were actually talking and, you know, is it going to be recommended that you give patients a starter kit of those uh, over-the-counter medicines as well as do doxy as well to take at the first onset? So there's a lot that has to be done. Uh, you know, dose reductions don't do a heck of a lot for this, uh, so it's probably going to be more just symptomatic management as it comes up, which is tough, right? I mean, but honestly, it's not going to be much different than cetuximab. We're all pretty much used to giving cetuximab, and, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, in this day of, of uber specialization, a lot of thoracic oncologists may not remember how to give cetuximab, um, but that's probably how you manage it. And again, one thing that we've briefly touched on before are the infusion-related uh, reactions. 
they happen usually during first time and then we never tend to see them again. That's been my experience. That's been the experience in most of the clinical trials. So another thing to keep in mind that after a patient has had a reaction up front, we tend not to see this again. Yeah, and it's interesting because if you talk to the people that are giving it that are all thoracic oncologists, you know, we're all community-based doctors, so we're used to seeing things like daratumumab infused in the clinic, and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, how are community oncologists going to do this? Well, we've been giving dara for a long time, and it's the exact same thing. It's the exact yep. same basis of the antibody, and it literally is, if you get it the first time, you don't get it the second time. What you learn over time is you just need a whiff that first day. You know, it's the first daily dose is put into two doses, and if they get that whiff, they almost never react the second day. So it's not, it, it's really easy to do if you remember that. As you guys said very eloquently, it's not like Taxol. If you get it the first day, don't give it the second time. It sure. goes away very nicely. Absolutely. Okay, so for the last little bit, let me change our focus to rep fusion positive non-small cell lung cancer. Lung cancer truly has been the poster child for precision medicine. And yet another phase three practice changing study, Libretta 431, where we look at sulpercatinib versus chemo IO approach in frontline settings. At the time of progression on chemo IO, again, the crossover was allowed. Alex, what did the study show? I mean, to me, this, you know, to me, there's no surprise here. I mean, this is almost stating the obvious. You have a phenomenal drug that works uh, in RET fusions, and you're basically asking, is a targeted therapy that works really well going to be better than chemo IO? And we all would have guessed the answer is yes, and this confirms that the answer is yes. What patient would not want to go on an oral drug that has very limited toxicity versus, you know, Kena-189, which is triplet therapy? So it works. There's no surprise here. I imagine most of these patients were done XUS because most of us, a standard of care, were given this anyhow in the United States. But again, it confirms that a targeted therapy by TFS, uh, by response rates, is better than uh chemo IO here. Right. As you stated, no surprises here. This is yet another data which sets a new standard of care treatment amongst our red fusion patient population. Alex, thank you so much for going over these practice changing data from ESMO 2023 with us today. For our listeners, stay tuned for a summary. Thanks for having me. It was a great ESMO. We were kidding around. It was ESMO lung. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> we keep, keep indeed. Hear, we keep hearing this. In this segment, we have covered four important studies in lung cancer from ESMO 2023 with Dr. Alex Spira. Amivantamab with chemotherapy in metastatic EGFR exon 20 insertion mutation in non-small cell lung cancer patient population should be, in fact, a new standard of care. The same agent, amivantamab, but in combination with lizertinib, also showed improvement in progression-free survival in first-line settings for activating EGFR mutation you have to be mindful about increased risk of VTEs and infusion reactions. We also now have data on emivantamab in second line in the same patient population, and the CNS responses here are very impressive. With Dr. Spira, we also covered the data supporting the use of cell per catnip in frontline setting for red fusion positive small, small cell lung cancer patient population. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to check out our highlights on breast, GI and GU cancer from ESMO 2023. We are the Oncology Brothers.